Well, it's nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chloe. Sending us cake. <laughs> I'm Jade. Nice Hi, to meet Jade. you. This is our land ball, and this is Joel, my Hi, partner in crime and teaching the books videos. And Hi, also, Joel. Uh, as a professor at St Andrews, one of your customers. Maybe you could tell us what cakes you picked today to try with us. Well, the cakes that uh, we've chosen to have today, uh, the fudge donuts uh, and the Florentines. The gluten-free gluten fudge, fudge, fudge donuts, because I have a problem with wheat these days, which is sometimes inconvenient, <laughs> I think it would be fair to say. Um, but I, I just I have such great memories of fudge donuts going right back to my childhood, uh, growing up in Kirkcaldy. Uh, a fudge donut was a huge treat. It wasn't something you'd get every week, uh, and they were just so delicious. Such, such indulgence. And we've also got Florentine's milk and plain, because Joel prefers milk chocolate and I prefer plain chocolate, I do. so it's absolutely perfect That's for lovely. both of us. Ah. I, love, I love a Florentine, I love, I love the crunch of a Florentine. I keep hoping I'm going to become more sophisticated in my taste. I keep hoping I'm going to be one of these very elegant people who likes a dark chocolate. But no, <laughs> I've got I've got a Scottish sweet tooth. I just love I just love milk chocolate too much. Well, that's like me. I don't drink coffee and I don't drink red red wine. And I keep thinking one day maybe I'll get into them. Oh, oh you you struggle in this house because those are our primary beverages. We Chloe and I had a conversation the other day about um you know we we create these new products, but the two of us don't have uh, very wide tastes when it comes to cake. So. Like to me, a Florentine is like a posh cake because there's because there's nuts in it, you know, there's nuts and there's fruit in it. And to me, that's just like that's that's like a grown up thing to like, you it's know, almost healthy. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure your geography department at St Andrews would be happy to help testing out new recipes. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, this the, the Florentine there, you guys will be um some of the first to test it because we've we uh when you said you liked the Florentine, we sort of we were like, right, let's work and adapt the recipe to to make it gluten free. Um, and then while we were at it, we adapted the recipe so that there was also no dairy in it. So obviously, the milk chocolate version still has milk, but it means that the dark chocolate one is also um, dairy free and and therefore vegan. Okay, I can't. That's lovely. It's not easily a lot last week. Not that lovely. Yeah. Of course, if you're doing these cake breaks, you should get in touch with the forensics department at Dundee University because their their meetings run on cake. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've not. I've never had a meeting with the the forensics team there that hasn't involved cake. Sometimes, which you've bought to bribe them. Mm -hmm. I have bought. I have bought cake to bribe them on occasion. Well, a very good currency, a cake. I think. Yeah, I suppose there's probably a bit of that in your work as well. Like if you you need, you're you're you know you need to bend someone's ear or, or get a favor from them and find something out. Like I imagine that you probably work quite closely with folk in departments like Dundee Forensics, which I don't know a lot about, but you know I've read a lot about um, Sue Black, so I get the feeling that they're very highly regarded. So probably a lot of people trying to get their. Uh, Oh, yeah, nice. yeah uh, Sue's not there anymore. She, she's at Lancaster now, but yeah. the department is still, I think, um, as vibrant and as well regarded as, as it ever was. Uh, Neve McDade runs the, the forensic department there now, and, and she's, she's fascinating because her areas of expertise are drugs, explosives, and what's the other one? Fire. Fire. Yes. <laughs> so you can, I mean, I just remember being so jealous once where I'd been in an afternoon of meetings work and you'd gone off and you said well I've got to go and work and you came back and said oh <laughs> I went out a chat with, with Neve we blew something up and then we went for cocktails <laughs> <laughs> why isn't my afternoon like that mm. I've got more from wrong thing. so what <laughs> just whilst, whilst Val's incapacitated what's your <laughs> what's your favorite cakes then I feel like we're like legally obliged to say fudge donut, but it isn't. That's definitely not my favorite cake. I'm not a custard fan, so like similarly to you saying that you thought your tastes might develop, I'm still partial to just like a simple 
brownie. It's quite yeah. an interesting childhood to have all these cakes just there. It wasn't even a treat. It was just they were there for us to have because we grew up in the family business. So often I would pick like a nice cheese course rather than a pudding, actually. <laughs> well, sometimes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, you just want something simple like a scone, like a cheese scone or, or a sultana scone. Um, without actually having to dive in at the deep end of, of, of cream and, and custard and chocolate and gooeyness. But I think it's quite interesting how we have these histories of... So you're not ill? No, I'm not ill. Why would you say that? I like a scone. <laughs> you know I like a scone. One of our cookery videos we did scones. <laughs> we did treacle scones for Halloween. It's a special. Um, but I think it's quite interesting that the, the, way that, the way that baking goes in terms of generations as my gran did not bake at all. She was a really good cook, but she didn't bake. But she said, well, why would I bother baking when the cooperative van comes around with perfectly good pancakes? Uh, and so she she never, I don't remember her ever baking. And I think in a, re a rebellion against this, when my mum got married, she developed um, a real passion for baking. She actually, she went to night school yeah. to, to learn how to, to be a, a baker. And actually I found, a, a, to, I dug out this, which is Woman Magazine Cookery Book, which was her Bible for years. I, I just, I think the first time I noticed it actually says May 1951 inside it, she's written in it, which was three years after she got married. And the first thing on, on the page is gingerbread. Oh, nice. And it's just torn recipes out of, of, of magazines and things all in here. And she always she she baked a lot when I was when I was growing up, and uh, she later became involved with Kirkcaldy Bowling Club. And you know how the women will, would always make the teas for the men on the Saturday for the matches, uh, and I just loved the way that there was this notion that everybody had their speciality, and that was yours. You know, it was like you know, Mima does the meringues. Yeah. And. God help you if you joined the bowling club and, and unbeknownst to you, you baked somebody else's speciality. I mean, there was that. <laughs> did your mum have a speciality? She, she had several specialities. One of the ones she always did for the bowling green was sherry balls. Sherry balls? Sherry balls, which looked a bit like a rum truffle, but were made with sherry instead of rum coconut okay. on the outside, toasted coconut on the outside. They were very nice. Uh, and my dad made the shortbread. That was his. My dad did two bits of baking. He made the shortbread uh, and he made the mince pies with flaky pastry at Christmas time. I've got shortbread today as my treat. Petticoat tail. Nice Scottish, yes. Scottish shortbread. And a lovely retro um, teapot there. Oh, it's my favourite, yeah. That's great. <laughs> I'm going to have another bit of Florentine, so carry on. <laughs> We, we both love cooking um, and we, we each have our, our specialities and we cook for each other. We don't do a lot of baking because, well, we have no self-control. <laughs> if we, if we'd have to bake extremely small batches because if not, uh, in fact, even when Val was, when we were doing our cooking the books and we did sweet treats, we had to then distribute it amongst the neighbours so we wouldn't just sit and motor through it. That's a lie. We said we were going to distribute the cake. <laughs> So we, made, so we made the forensic cake, which we did because of the cakes always take. I've, I've, I've adapted the, the Dundee habit of, of cake and forensics into the book. So when, when Karen Perry goes off to, to talk to her forensic science friend, there's often cake involved. And so we, we decided one of the cookies in the book should be forensic cake. So I made a, a chocolate um, flour free cake you know, with, with, with ground almonds. And, you know, we, we, we said beforehand, this is going to be far too much for us. We'll have to, you know, cut it into chunks and take it around the neighbours. Mm -hmm. We didn't take it around the neighbours. You didn't need to admit that. I'm, 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 just, I'm just being honest here. You're you too know. honest. I'm too honest because some of the neighbours might watch this or listen to this, you know? Yeah, I was going to say that. She never did that. Oh, oh, we, we didn't get any. <laughs> yeah, they'll, yeah, we took it to all the neighbours and you've just, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, we, we, did, we did take the scones round, didn't we? That's because they've gone a bit odd, <laughs> a bit flat. <laughs> My the thing for me that gets me when I bake, it's not like it. Ne it's never at the stage where I've got all this stuff to hand out. The danger for me is before it's baked. So, so my speciality is these really rich double, well, triple chocolate cookies. You know, they're so there's just everything about it. The batter is 
chocolatey, the chocolate chips are chocolatey. And, you know, the recipe maybe makes like 18 cookies, but you're lucky if you get 12 because I've eaten so much of it out of the, oh, out of the mixer. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's really dangerous. Like I have to really go like I'm going to make cookies and then I have to think, can't like can my health take that this week you know <laughs> well and, and I mean for me growing up and I'm sure you were the same one of the pleasures was was when your when your mum was baking you got to lick the spoon and lick the bowl mm. but now we have silicon spatulas and the bowl is like clean yeah <laughs> there's just, just nothing there's nothing left because it's all it's all in the tin gone in, mm-hmm. the tray gone into the oven <laughs> mm-hmm. um so that's that's I mean I don't know what uh, what kids growing up today are going to have memories of baking. Well, you can just leave a wee bit around the bowl. Why? <laughs> I think that the spa- the these silicon spatulas just they just help you get more onto the spatula, which then you can eat. Like <laughs> so that's my view on it. So I I am um, ha- um, I'm a big reader, but usually sci-fi and I'll be this is a bit embarrassing but I don't read a lot of crime because I find it quite scary like you know like I if I, I'll be then in bed going what was that noise what was that noise <laughs> so when Chloe said that you had agreed to come on I uh, spoke to a friend of mine who's a big crime fan and she and she said well you've got to read The Distant Echo because it's set in St Andrews so I so I was like great fab let's do it and oh I just totally fell in love with it and I and it's like I've never read, I've never read any kind of um, even story set in St. Andrews. So it was so, ex- like it was, I was almost giddy, you know, I was reading it and, and, and uh, my partner's sitting there and I'm like, they, they've gone to a party in Learmonth Gardens, you know, <laughs> like, like I can, we can see that from the window. And, um, and then there, you know, and they're, they're, there's characters that work at the paper mill and it's just all these things that are, for me, they felt like Easter eggs. Um, but obviously, to, to to a reader that's not from the area, they're probably just like, yeah, the paper mill, that's probably still there, you know, maybe. But it got me thinking, like, you know, how like how well do you know St. Andrews? And then and then more than that, you know, how how do you get to know an area in order to, you know, if you're not necessarily from there, or do you do you deliberately pick places that you have that in-depth knowledge of that you can really create a a, a really a like enticing reality yeah it, it always helps to be writing about a place that you you know quite intimately and what tends to happen it's not often it happens that, that a place specifically inspires a novel but very often when I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the story and the shape of the story and the kind of place this needs to be so when I had the idea for the distant echo I knew it had to be a university town or city and but I also wanted it to be quite a small community. I didn't want it to be a great big sprawling city like Manchester or Glasgow. Um, and I'd, growing up in Fife, uh, I knew St Andrews and all along the East Newt pretty well because uh, a, a, the big thing in our family was that somebody would go out for a run in the car um, and the run would always involve a tea shop uh, and a walk. So over the years, uh, I spent you know much of my childhood wandering about places like St Andrews and Crail and Enster and the north coast of Fife and that was what we did on a Sunday so I had a sort of background sense of, of what St Andrews was like and, and, and having explored it but yes and so and, and of course I've been to the Lammas Fair lots of times and mm-hmm. so yeah it's, it's a place that had had these good memories for me and it fitted what I needed for the story so I thought St Andrews that's perfect I can set it there and um, then when you start looking into things more, researching them more. My first idea was that the body would be found in the, the graveyard at the cathedral, because that's quite gothic and spooky yeah. and very atmospheric. Um, but I went, I went off to the St Andrew's Citizen, which I'd arranged to see their archives, because when you're, the book has got two time frames, as, as you know. And when I'm researching uh, the, the distant time frame, if you like, it's really helpful to go and read the newspapers of the time because that gives you a sense not just of what's happening on the on a sort of bigger scale, you know, and what's in the national news or whatever, but what people locally were talking about, you know, what terrible things the students were doing, what was happening in the court, um, what pictures were on the cinema, how much was a new coat, how much mm-hmm. was a pint of lager, and that was really how, how that started. But in general, as I say, I tend, 
um, know places reasonably well before I write about them because I, I need to have quite a strong sense of what the place is like. But now and again, a place does does really strike me as, as, as having the potential for a story, even if I don't have the story at the time. Speaking to a friend of mine, um about the distant echo and because uh, he he had read it so he was asking me what i thought and i was just saying you know it was just so exciting but he was just like yeah he goes i really liked it but never going never um cutting across hallow hill again and <laughs> just, you really have to think twice but then on reflection you're like hallow hill that's you know just the name of that you could totally imagine there being like stories i mean Growing up, the stories I always heard were like from the laid braes. You know, you don't go through the laid braes at night. You know, sort of a, a I don't know what you'd call it, a forested walk along the side of the burn here. But um, Hallow Hill, like we know it from childhood is somewhere you go sledging. So yeah, it'd be interesting to have that sort of sinister side to it. Um, fancy, fancy, sinister everywhere. I mean, I we, imagine, yeah, we were we were off on what I imagined was a really romantic holiday. So we went off on a, we, 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 we rented a boat on the River Sound and uh, we were just gonna have a week cruising on the river um, and we were gonna have lovely food in France and we were just gonna take our time. Mm. And you immediately thought murder. Mm. Well, excuse me. I thought, I, I, thought I managed to choose a moment <laughs> where I might get some, I might get my, my story in. <laughs> in fairness, I mean, it wasn't just be spontaneously thinking about murder. Because the thing is, in this country, if you go on a boating holiday, you have to tie up at a recognised mooring at night, you know, a, a marina or a place where boats are allowed to tie up. But in France, you can stop anywhere in the night for the night. Um, and much of the, the countryside around us was like beautiful woodland, um, but distant from a road, and you couldn't really get there readily on foot, but you could get there and tie your boat up and go for a wee walk through the forest. And in order to, to make this easier for those of us on the boats, that we were supplied with five sharpened metal stakes and a mallet. How can you not think about murder? And a perfect body disposal yeah. site, you know, deep woodland where not many dog walkers are gonna find the body. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it seemed to me to be perfect. So I was already, I was already like three steps ahead. Mm. You're lucky still to be alive. I am, really. <laughs> We, we used to go on uh, longboat holidays when we were growing up, um, just down in England on the canals and stuff. And one of my, like the, probably the strongest memories of it was one day Chloe <laughs> looked over, we were on the edge of the canal and Chloe looked over and her glasses just fell off her face into the <laughs> canal. And I can't remember if it was our mum or our dad, but they were taking none of it and they made her get in the canal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which now you think, no, no, that, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't that it was deep, but the water is so horrible. It could have been anything. Yeah. I had to use my Remember it. to find the glasses and then like pick them up with my feet. And it was, <laughs> it could have been anything under there. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could, I mean you, could have, you could have stumbled across the dead body. Yeah. So that's probably quite a good starting point for a, a, a novel. Mm -hmm. Kid drops glasses in water, parents make them go in, come up and say, there's a body down there, mum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to ask, so you've mentioned that you both love cooking, like did you, when the first lockdown hit, we were like blown away with how much people want, couldn't, we couldn't get flour in the supermarkets, so we were bagging flour all day, there was people bagging big bags of flour from Kokodi into little bags of flour that customers could come and buy, and it seemed like the world was just suddenly baking banana bread and scones and all sorts, did you take up any sort of hobbies like that during the lockdown? Pesto. Pesto, yeah. <laughs> Pesto. Um, we, like, it's this time of year, it's the anniversary of, of lockdown beginning, and so it's, it, it's this time of year for the wild garlic to come into uh, its own. Which um, we just stumbled on when we were, we weren't looking for it, but we were going to, one, one, we, we kind of got into a bit of a routine each day that um, I would be working in my office, I've just, I was just on endless Teams and Zoom calls, and you were doing your thing, starting you writing your book and having meetings, and we kind of pass each other in the kitchen, normally making coffee mm. during the day, and then we got into the habit of going for a walk at the end of the day. And it was like, what did you do today? I was work for you, and it just kind of gave a bit of structure to the day. Um, but suddenly we'd, we we were on our walk with, I can smell garlic, 
And we realised that uh, all, all around the sort of banks of the, the water reef, which is one of the places that we go for a walk, was just carpeted, carpeted yeah. with wild garlic. So we started filling plastic bags with, with wild garlic when we went for our walk and, and making pesto. Uh, so we had, at one point, we had four or five different kinds of pesto in the fridge, you know, walnut, pistachio, cashew, pine nut, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of oils going. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, we made a big, big jar of wild garlic oil um, and, and worked our way through that for cooking and salads. And so that was our that was our big lockdown fad. I mean, in terms of new new hobbies, it would be making the the cookery videos, which started yeah. as a everyone was wanting content. Yeah, and uh, you know, I we we recorded a few things where you've been into you know, d doing the usual book chat. It was like well, we have to try and do something different. Because I thought I was being bored. I mean, I, I, just kept, I felt like I was saying the same things again and again and again and again. And anybody who had seen me once, you know, was, was, was never going to look at me again because essentially uh, it, it's difficult for a writer. It's not like a comedian. We can't just write a new shtick. You know, there is, there is only one story of how I became a writer. There is only mm. one story of me talking about my latest book. And so I thought we need to do something different. We need to do something that, that will... will I don't know, cheer people up, engage with people that isn't just me sitting talking about me. And so we thought, because a lot of people have talked about uh, reading about the things that the characters in the books cook or eat and how it, oh, it made me so hungry I had to go <laughs> and cook something. So we thought we'd, we'd do a, a couple of videos about things that people in the books eat. Uh, and, and we did, the first one we did was Hamish's Hipster Porridge. And people were just loving it. And then, so we did, then we did Karen's lentil stovies. Yeah. And it just it just became a thing. I think we've got about 25,000 views in total at the yeah. moment, which is it's quite know, good. It's quite good, really. It's a bit, a bit mental. Mm. By the way, these quarantines are a long way. Excuse me. Mouthful. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these are substantial Florentines. I approve of that. We call them that chonky Florentines. Mm. <laughs> the um, the, the gluten-free fudge donut. The, the last video we recorded um, was uh, with Josie Long, the comedian, as she had requested the gluten-free fudge donut. Um, so she brought up the slightly controversial fact that at the moment our gluten-free fudge donuts aren't technically a donut. So it's more of a cupcake. Um, and uh, it really has put us back on the trail to sort of find a supplier of gluten-free donut mix because that's what happened. We used to, we had a separate fryer for the gluten-free donuts and we got a gluten-free donut mix. And then there was basically, they made the minimum order for the gluten-free mix, went from a couple of bags to like 20 ton and suddenly it wasn't something we could do anymore. So a lot of gluten-free donuts. Yeah. yeah, but it's been it's been a couple of years. So we're kind of back on the case now, like actually let, let's see, maybe there's a new supplier, maybe they've changed their rules. We can try and... Do I'm it as a, to, I'm gonna as have a to traditional the, donut. I'm going to attack the fudge donut now, I'm going to get my mouth around it, actually. <laughs> well, not, is, not without getting it all down yeah. your front. No, but mind no. you, that's got to go in the wash now anyway. Mm. Mm. We, were, really, we mm. were in New Zealand mm. about 18 months ago. And mm. 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 <laughs> that's awfully good. It is. Awfully good. Oh, yeah. Good fudge. Good mix. Good balance between the fudge and the cream and the donut. Very, very good. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm. Put more of it in your mouth and I'll talk. <laughs> we, we, because we, we, Val, been struggling getting um, good gluten-free things here a couple of years ago, and then we went to New Zealand, and it was a, it was a revelation. Mm. It, it, almost everything was available gluten-free. I'm sure if you can get hold of a, a New Zealand supplier, there'll not be a problem for your donut <laughs> yeah. mix. Whereabouts in New Zealand were you? We're in the South Island. We were supposed to have been there um, this past autumn as well, but obviously with. Mm lockdown so we've both got visiting professorships at University of Otago and Dunedin. Oh wow. Edinburgh, Edinburgh of the South. Yeah hmm. which is very weird because many of the street names are the same as Edinburgh. Yeah. The relationship to each other is completely different. So actually Princess Street you carry on down Princess Street in Dunedin and it takes you into George Street as opposed to being parallel to George Street. And I find it quite confusing to begin with. I didn't think I was in Edinburgh so I wasn't. <laughs> You don't know what the street names are in Edinburgh. That's true. That's true. But uh, yeah, that was great. So we're we were hoping to be getting back in, back this autumn, but who knows mm. what's what's mm. going to be happening. That's very nice. Oh. 
we're glad to both approve of the gluten-free offerings. Mm. You're in work in St Andrews and you're, you're looking for a way to make me happy and bring me a little treat when you come home. But me coming home is not enough. No. <laughs> no. I have to say, you coming home with a fudge donut beats just you coming home. Oh, nice to know. Thank yes. you. <laughs> I was going to ask, so you grew up in Kokodi, like, do you come back to Fife a lot? Do you spend a lot of time visiting? Yeah, we, we, we do spend a lot of time because, of course, with Joe working in St Andrews, we do spend a lot of time in Fife. When we're allowed to. When we're allowed to. We've not been, we've not been uh, back in Fife since October, obviously. We've got a wee cottage in St Monans, which is handy for, it's handier for commuting when Joe's at work. So um, we've, not, we've not been there since October and I really, really miss the sea um, and, uh, and, and the Fife coastal path. And yeah, exactly. one of the things that, that's really changed though, from when I was growing up in Fife, is that the range of, of local produce is now tremendous. Um, yeah. So many really good food suppliers and, you know, good craft bakers like yourself, good butchers, fishmongers. You know, in, in, in St Monans, we've got wonderful access to, to fish. Mm. Uh, and, of course, we've got the Bowhouse Market, which has all sorts of things there, uh, delightful stuff. And none of this really was around when, when we were we. It was, you know, there was two kinds of bread, plain or pan. Was it you three know, vegetables and three vegetables? Yeah, uh, so that's something that I think has been a, a complete revolution. I, I, I wrote a, a radio series, radio serial, uh, in 2017 called Resistance, which was about a, a global outbreak of disease, uh, and essentially a pandemic that came close to completely wiping out humanity. And it was a project that I did in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust. And uh, they, they do this thing every year where they bring together uh, radio drama writers, radio producers and scientists. And they choose a theme every year and you spend time with the scientists, thinking about the science behind something. And um, the year I did it, it was antimicrobial resistance. Essentially, there's a plague coming and the drugs don't work. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had Sally Davis, the chief medical officer uh, in England and Wales at the time, uh, talking to us and essentially saying, you know, we're all going to die. There's a plague coming and we're all going to die. And I, and I came away from this thinking the only thing I can write is an apocalypse. <laughs> so I did this radio serial and, and it was well received. Yeah. Like I said. Uh, and it's now, it's now got a second life. Was, um, Welcome asked me if I'd turn it into a novel and I didn't want to turn it into a novel because I kind of felt like I've written this once, I don't want to write it again. Um, and we decided to turn it into a graphic novel. So I found an artist, she's actually American, but at the time she was, she was living and working in Dundee. Uh, and she's, she's drawn the pictures basically, and, and it looks amazing. And we had it ready to roll last summer, but we're mm. thinking this is really not the time for this. Mm. Um, and, but now it's a very different climate, you know, with, with, with the vaccine and also with a much better understanding of the nature of COVID. So that's coming out now at the end of end of May. Resistance, the graphic novel. But yeah, so that's 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 going to be uh, something for for people to ponder on uh, this summer. Uh, I don't. The only thing we haven't touched on was Dundee. I was. We've got a shop in Dundee as well, and I recently watched Traces. So, have you spent? I take you spent a lot of time in Dundee with the forensics department. Is that how that idea came about? Yeah, really. It, it's. Um, because over, over the years, I've got to know a lot of forensic scientists, mostly, and I mean, initially through Sue Black. Um, we've been friends now for 20 odd years. Um, and, you know, she's always been my go-to person. And when she doesn't know the answer, she passes me on. I felt like being part of past the parcel from time to time, you know. Here's Val, talk to her about toxicology, you know. Here's Val, talk to her about botany. Um, and so over the years, I've got to, to know them quite well. And the one thing that all the forensic scientists just, you know, heads explode about is the way that forensic science is portrayed on television, the way it's portrayed on like CSI or Silent Witness, or, um, you know, Witness, Witness, I think you're yeah, Silent Witness, yeah. Um, and, and Waking the Dead, where, you know, one forensic science covers every <laughs> single speciality in 10 minutes. Uh, and they, they, yeah, we they, rewatched that over the lockdown. You just muttered darkly through the whole I thing. Know. That's not possible. <laughs> she would never do that. Oh, she's going to be an expert on this as well now. Is she? And and then they interrogate the the suspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh God, it's, it's bad, bad. Um, so as I say, I've, I've listened to this for years, and then going on about how, 
how, how television messes up what they do in, in terms of it, interpreting it. And um, so I thought, you know, because I've, I've heard all these stories over the years, there's enough wow moments for real not to have to fake it. Uh, so I, I went off and, and talked to Nicola Schindler, who runs Red Productions, who have made things like uh, Scott and Bailey and Happy Valley and It's a Sin and Years and Years. And, and I said, it's about time somebody made a series that shows what forensic science is really like. Uh, and they got very excited about that. And we, we started to develop what has become Traces. And Dundee was the obvious place to, to set it because of, of the department there, because frankly, because I've got an in with the department there and I could introduce them to people. And also I knew that they would co be cooperative and, and help us to make it accurate and make it work. Um, and it's also a, 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 a city, a, a Scottish city you don't see on the television. Yeah. It's either Edinburgh, Glasgow or the Highlands. Yeah, and we wanted to get away from that, mm. that axis. And uh, especially now you know, with a new waterfront where it really is, you know, as you approach Dundee, it looks really smart and attractive. The production people yeah. thought it was wonderful. I know. They? They, well, they, when they came to film there, they were, they were, they were there for two weeks um, and uh, it only rained one afternoon. And so they were doing all these exterior shots and the sun was shining. And oh, it's lovely here. We're, we're going to a game fair at Scon at the weekend. <laughs> and they're all planning to come back for their holidays yes. in Dundee. <laughs> I, was just thinking, you know, I said, do you like me to see in February? <laughs> um, but they're back filming now. I mean, they will actually right be, now, yeah. in, it'll be in Dundee um, in, in June, I think. Is it, June? it is June. Um, so they started the filming for series two. Oh. Uh, and again, it's set set in Dundee, uh, but as I say, the, the shots they got of Dundee were, were amazing because it just looked it looked fabulous. It looked so glamorous. It looks really good, yeah. Several Dundonians were saying, "Like, how did you manage that?" <laughs> but uh, yeah, it looks good, uh, and and it's 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 good for um, the city as well for their local economy because people will come and, and come and see the locations. Uh, this always happens with a series when it becomes successful. Mm -hmm. And we're good. And St Andrews is going to be a, a star of the Karen Piri series soon, um, which also will be filming because we're filming the distant echo. Filming the distant echo. Amazing. So if you see camera crews around uh, St Andrews, that will be that will be why. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. So that starts. So that also starts filming in June. I mean, I'll be I'll be dotting between sets. Will you be dotting about? I'll be dotting about. Hopefully, hopefully, if I'm allowed. <laughs> You'll have yeah. to send the crew in for a little donut uh, on their brain. Aye, aye, that's it, yeah. Oh, yeah, they'll never, they'll never be out once they've come. In the map. I tell you, that'll be, that'll be the, the, the place of choice. Yeah. We we often will come up with a new product. Um, you know, for instance, the other, the other day, Chloe, uh, Chloe and my mum came up with the idea for a strawberry tower. So it's like our coffee tower, which is a shoe pastry bun with coffee cream in it. And, uh, and that's, that's a really popular cake and so Chloe and my mum decided for Mother's Day we would do a strawberry tower so shoe pastry bun but it's got strawberry cream in it and we thought great and Chloe we, we made a few Chloe put them on Facebook and the next day it like just blew up people were like to like thousands and thousands of people were commenting on this post going like what like this is amazing where can I get one you know we sent them to the shops they sold out every day and and we were just so kind of surprised I guess like we thought they'd be popular but we didn't think they'd be that popular um but then other times you can make something you can you can make a cake and like you know sometimes you'll make a cake and you'll step back and you'll be like yeah I've nailed it you know I've told that's like I've nailed it and uh there's a line and it's kind of a bit of a spoiler but I guess like spoiler alert if you haven't read the distant echo yet there's a line in it that absolutely like floored me. Although I wasn't, I was lying in bed, so it didn't like floor me, floor me. But there's a line in it where, um, uh, where after the fire at Ziggy's, and it it's <laughs> word for word, I can't remember, but it's something about you know Alex is talking and he's saying Ziggy played guitar, yeah, well not anymore kind of thing. And I just immediately started crying, like it was it really hit me. And I wondered if when you're writing, do you ever have a moment where you write something and you're just like. That, yeah like you know actually really like kind of really pleased with yourself and like that is that's a great dialogue or a great line that's going to really hit people hard that's going to make people cry yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, I think um i suppose i, I mean I, I try to take care 
kind of sentence on sentence when I'm writing. And when you're particularly trying to create an effect, um, there's a lot of thinking goes into how to create that effect to make it work. Uh, and yeah, sometimes you, you write, sometimes you, you, you write a line and you think that's, that's absolutely it, that's nailed it. Um, but unfortunately it doesn't happen every day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great feeling when when there's when you do get something that you feel is just just going to right it's, it's right and it's going to affect people. Either it's it's going to um, make them smile or it's going to make them cry or it's going to make gonna freak them out or whatever. <laughs> don't, don't hope, I don't I try not to freak them out too much because I do want people to keep on reading. <laughs> you know, um, I remember one review that, <laughs> which stopped me. Saying, they said, this is a book to read with the light on. <laughs> yes. Would you read a book without the light exactly. on? Exactly. So, yes. So, yeah, yeah. When I get things, when I get things right, I'm, I'm always just kind of happy about that. Was it that was moments when you get the last line of the chapter and you think, yeah, that's just, that's exactly where to stop. Yes. I've got one last thing I wanted to ask, which um, is lockdown related. So we've sat down and had a nice bit of cake and a chat and I wondered, once things ease and you can travel and go and see people again, who's the first person you want to go and have cake with? Oh, that's a good question. Good question. See, I, I've become slightly anxious about being around people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, part of me is desperate to see lots of people, but at the same time, I, it's kind of, this has kind of reinforced all of my anxiety around lots of people. Yeah. I think we've we've kind of we've kind of got a little list, if you like, of, of of friends that we want to get together with and sit around the dining table with. And I don't really want to rank them in order of preference because somebody <laughs> might be offended. But what I am really looking forward to to seeing my son and sitting down and having a, a cup of tea and 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 a cake indeed with with my mm. sons. I've not I've not actually seen him since July. Oh. He's in university. He's down south. He's in York, um, and it's just not really been feasible for him to, to visit or for me to visit him because uh, it would be irresponsible uh, and tempting though it is. Um, you know, when, 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 it's, when it looked like we might have five days at Christmas, um, he wanted to come up and, and I, just, I just said, no, I don't want you to come up. I, I, I desperately want to see you, but I don't think it's, it's responsible. I don't think it's socially right for you to do that. So yeah, I'm longing to, I'm longing to see him. I'm looking forward to seeing my sister. Yeah. I haven't seen her for over a year. Yeah. She's not been to St Monin's yet. So, yeah, I'll, I'll put her top on my list. Yeah. But I, think it's, I think it's just getting back into the... I mean, I was sort of, I was sort of being somewhat flippant about people. Um, but what I am... I, I don't have any great desire to go to, to crowded places, but just the, the simple pleasures of having a few friends around for dinner. Mm -hmm. And being able to have you know a few glasses of wine and just and just talk and not have to not have to kind of plan it and it being a big a big occasion, but just to get yeah. back into the into the rhythm of of that sort of conviviality, I think is yeah. what I'm really missing. Because we, we the first night the first day we were allowed to see other people outside, we sat we we've got um a little sort of. Uh, courtyard kind of below street level at the front of the houses here and we went to ours is a bit of a, a bit of a disaster but our neighbors is is all spruced up so we went and sat with them outside and it started raining it was baltic and it was raining but we were we got we got the umbrellas out we're sitting there whiskey in one hand umbrella in the other hand my legs were absolutely soaking it to be hours to warm up again but we were not going inside because we were allowed to be sociable and we yeah. were going to be sociable yeah and that was fun it was fun, fun. but really i would like fun. to get into the kind of of it being slightly more yeah. normal and routine yeah and and to go out to restaurants again yeah. and sit and have, have sit and have a meal with, with friends i miss i miss my my writing colleagues um and, and i realized towards the tail end of last year that this was actually really i think causing me to, to feel quite downwardly really because it's not it's not that we talk about writing and, and technique and all that all the time but but it's just sort of like that there's, there's a sense of being around people who who operate in a in a creative way and and you have different i mean i have different conversations with with, with other writers and, and filmmakers than conversations i have with other friends and i was really missing those conversations so i started and um meeting them for a walk 
So one at a time. One at a time. One at a time. Quite mm. within the rules. Uh, and we'd go off for a, for a walk, uh, and and that turned things round for me a lot. I was in a meeting with our um, the manager of our uh, shops, sort of regional manager role, and she uh, she's she's celiac, so that's that's a difficult yeah. <laughs> job for her. Yeah. And we were talking about. Um, I was telling her about the Florentine and there's got a couple of cakes in the pipeline to have a few more gluten-free options. And uh, she said, well, I've got a great recipe for gluten-free shoe pastry. Really? And I was like, well, let us, let us sort the gluten-free fudge donut. Let's make that actually a donut. And then maybe that could be next on our list to sort out a gluten-free. Oh, shoe a gluten-free pastry. shoe would, would be, would be, Really so good. that's what I need yeah. to turn up with at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. you're on our list of taste testers. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Always happy to oblige. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you both very much. I hope you enjoyed having a nice little cake break with us. Absolutely. We did. It was thank lovely. You. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Great to meet you both. Yeah. You I'll see you in the shop in Santander soon. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.